let's discuss TCM theory, the main characteristics. The theoretical system of TCM is influenced by ancient philosophical thought and developed over long-term clinical practice. TCM theory consists of two aspects, holism and differential diagnosis and treatment. The key points, the main characteristics of the theoretical system of TCM, concept of holism, differential diagnosis and treatment. The key points, the concept of holism includes the following, the human body as an organic tool, the unity between human and environment. Fullness signifies the unity and integrity of an object. This holds that the human body is an organic whole in which all constituent parts are structurally inseparable, functionally coordinated, and interactive as well as pathologically inter-influencing. The human body is closely related to the natural and social environments. Through the process of adaptation, it maintains its balance balance activities. The concept of unity between the internal and external environment, the connection and integrity of body itself, as well as the balance, represent the wholeness of TCM theory. The wholeness concept is an important thinking method permeating in various areas such as physiology, pathology diagnosis, healthcare, and treatment. Number one, the human body as an organic whole. The human body is composed of different viscera and tissues. Each of them has a different functions, which are the constituent, which constitute part of the whole activity. A human's normal physiological activity is affected by the whole activity. On the other hand, it also influences the functions of other viscera and tissues. This kind of function is the whole activity. From the viewpoint of TCM, Integral unity is established by connecting the five sum visera, six pu visera, the five body constituents, and the sensory organs, the nine orifices, the four limbs, and the bones through the meridian system. The liver, gallbladder, tendon, and eye constitute the liver system. The heart, small intestine, vessels, and tongue constitute the heart system. The spleen, stomach, muscle, and mouth constitute the spleen system. The lung, large intestine, skin, and nose constitute the lung system. And the kidney, urinary bladder, bone, ear, and anus constitute the kidney system. This, consti this constitutes form the whole unity and accomplish its functional activities. Any local areas belong to the parts of the whole un unity. Local illness, diagnosis, and treatment must be based on the concept of wholeness. Otherwise, whole pathological changes will affect local disorder. Number two, the unity between human being and the external environment. Human being is a byproduct of natural evolution. From the TCM point of view, a human being is materially connected with the external environment. Human beings live in nature. Therefore, the external environment will directly or indirectly affect the functional activities of the human body. The body's beneficial adaptation to environmental changes belong to the category of physiologically adaptive adjustments. Otherwise, they are called pathological reactions and will result in disease. This idea is referred to as the unity between human being and the external environment. The next, the unity between human being and nature. Human beings live in nature. The natural factors, for example, as seasonal and climatic changes, day and night, as well as the geographical differences, can directly or indirectly affect the body's physiological functions and in general, it is warm in spring, hot in summer, damp in late summer, dry in autumn, and cold in winter. Under the influence of these climatic changes, there are many adaptation changes for living things. Germination in spring, growth in summer, change in late summer, rip in autumn, 
and storage in winter. Just as any other living things, human beings must also adapt themselves to climatic changes. For example, in spring and summer, the young chi rises upward and flourishes, whereas chi blood of the body trends to circulate superficially, which often result in loose skin, profuse sweating, and less urination. In autumn and winter, young chi goes inward and becomes astringent, whereas chi blood of the body tends to go internally, which often results in tight skin, less sweating, and more urination. These adaptations indicate that seasonal climatic changes can influence the body's physiological functions. Although daily temperature changes are not as obvious or regular as seasonal changes, long-term regular changes will result in the same rhythmic change as the day and night to adapt the changes in the environment. Geographical differences in living environment are also an important factor which can directly influence the physiological function of the human body. Regional clim climate and different cultures and customs are all geographical differences. They can affect the body's physiological function and mental activities to a certain degree. For instance, the southern, southern region of China is usually damp and hot, and the stray of the human body tends to be loose and body shape thin. The northern part, part of China is dry and cold, and the stray of the human body tends to be tight and the body shape is stronger. Next, the close relation between human beings and society. Human beings live in a society. Different social environments also result in different physical and mental functions. The change of social status definitely brings differences to the individual spiritual life. Social development enriches humans, widens living room, elevates level of health care, and promotes human living conditions and lengthens lifespan. On the other hand, with a turbulent society or war occurring frequently, an individual's physical and mental function will be affected more. The progress that society makes will undoubtedly bring many benefits to the human health. Due to the relationships of unity and opposition between the human being and the external environment, the principles of treatment according to time, different locations, and its individual have become the important rules in the TCM treatment. Therefore, more attention should be paid to the organic relationships between the external environment and the overall functional activity during the treatment process. Thank you for your attention. Let's discuss defecation as we continue with our discussion on interviewing. Feces and urine are waste matter expelled from the body. This is part of normal physiology and is the result of the body's metabolism. The metabolism requires that the five zang and six fu organs function harmoniously. Metabolic wastes are closely related with the transformative and transportative functions of the spleen and stomach, the dispersing and draining functions of the liver, the dispersing and descending functions of the lung, and the warming function of the kidney. The functions of the bladder and triple burner also play important roles in this process. Thus, inquiring about the process of defecation and urination will not only help one assess the functioning of the digestion and condi condition of water metabolism, but also the thermal nature of disease. Now, let's define what is defecation. In tenesmus, there is constant feeling of the need to empty the bowel accompanied by pain, cramping, and involuntary straining efforts. In dysentery, there is severe diarrhea with passage of mucus and blood. Now let's talk about its physiology of feces formation. 
While defecation is controlled directly by the large intestine, it is closely related with other organs. The spleen and stomach govern the reception, transportation, and transformation of water and food. The spleen transports the food essences up to the lung from where it is distributed to the entire body. The turbid descends to the small intestine where the clear is further separated from the turbid. The clear is sent back to the spleen and then descends to the lung to be distributed while the turbid is transported to the large intestine. The large intestine governs the conversion of matter forming the turbid matter into feces to be eliminated from the body. The dispersing and draining functions of the liver and the warming function of the kidney also play important roles in this process. Here is a diagram of the physiology of feces formation. So from the food and drink that we ingest, it goes to the stomach and the pure ascends to the spleen and the spleen sends it as a food essence to the lung, where the lung distributes to the other organs and tissues. So from the stomach, uh, the turbid descends to the small intestine, where from the small intestine, the pure ascends to the spleen, also going to the lung. While the turbid descends to the large intestine, going to the posterior green orifice, down to the uh, it turns into feces. So from the spleen also, um, the kidney with its warming function to the spleen will help it uh, to the food essence to rise to the lung. The liver with its dispersing and draining function will help the stomach um, <sighs> in its function to separate the pure and the turbid, okay. So in normal defecation, the healthy person defecates every day or every other day. Defecation is smooth without burning pain or uncomfortable sensation. The stool is brown, soft, and can maintain its own shape. There is no pus, blood, mucus, or undigested food in it. In our scope of inquiry about defecation, so inquiry about defecation should include the following. The form of stool, the color of stool, the smell, time and frequency of bowel movements, quantity of stool, sensations during defecation, and accompanying symptoms. So here is another diagram on the pathological uh, aspect of defecation. So abnormal defecation can be classified by frequency, form, color, and sensation into the following categories. So in abnormal defecation, there can be change in frequency. Uh, here we have constipation and diarrhea. The change in form stool could be with undigested food, alternating constipation and diarrhea, and a shapeless stool. If there is change in color, we can see dark brown. It could be black tire-like stool. It could be red if there's blood and white if there is pus in the stool, or it could be grayish white stool. If there is change in sensation, we can, uh, can manifest as, as in smooth defecation. There could be tenesmus a burning sensation, a sagging feeling, or a fecal incontinence. So in changes in the frequency of defecation, normal frequency is once per day or every other day. It is a morbid change if the defecation is more than three times per day or less than once every other day. So in constipation, there is difficulty in passing stool, prolonged interval between stools, or a desire to defecate without the ability to do so, either partially or completely. Its etiology and pathomechanism of constipation is associated with the dysfunction of the large intestine to transport. This dysfunction can, divided, can be divided into three causes.
The first is when the large intestine lacks moisture. This may be due to pathogenic heat in the large intestine and stomach, which consumes body fluids, or to yin or blood deficiency arising from a chronic illness, aging, profuse sweating, bleeding, or other improper treatment. The second cause of constipation is when the intestines lose their force and power of transportation. This may be caused by qi stagnation arising from emotional stress or by qi and yang deficiency as the result of a chronic illness or aging. The third cause of constipation is when the large intestine is obstructed by a pathological accumulation such as food or phlegm stagnation. This may result from improper diet, emotional stress, or dysfunction of the sangfu organ. Thank you for your attention. We now discuss diagnosis according to pathogenic qi. We continue with cold. Symptoms and signs of specific invasions of cold patterns. In wind cold, there is aversion to cold and wind, chills, headaches, stiffness in the shoulders and neck, lack of sweating, coughing, sneezing, clear watery secretions from the nose, slight or no fever, itchy throat, no thirst, and with a superficial tight and slow pulse. In cold B, this is B syndrome, where cold is the predominant pathogen. The movement of the joints are inhibited and there will be severe pain due to stagnation of qi and blood. The pain will be localized and will be intense. The pain is ameliorated by heat and motion and worse when exposed to cold and when there is inactivity. There will be a general aversion to cold, no sweating, and therefore increased urination, chills, and possibly muscle twitching. There will be a superficial, tight, and slow pulse. Cold in the stomach, there will be acute epigastric pain, explosive vomiting of clear fluids, acute sensitivity to cold. The symptoms will be provoked by the ingestion of cold foods and drinks, which often leads to vomiting. Symptoms are alleviated by heat. Stomach area will feel cold on palpation. Tongue will have a thick white coating and pulse will be deep and uh, tight, confined and slow, especially in the right one positions. For cold in the intestines, there is acute pain in the abdomen, painful watery diarrhea, acute sensitivity to cold, skin of the abdomen may feel cold and palpation, there may be cold extremities with thick white tongue coating, deep, tight, confined, and slow pulse, especially in the sure positions. For cold in the uterus, there will be cramping and biting menstrual pain, long menstrual cycle, brown menstrual blood containing clots that look like coffee grounds, infertility, the area above the pubic bone will feel cold and palpation, thick white tongue coating, deep, tight, confined, and slow pulse, especially in the sure positions. Treatment principle, expel cold. If there is wind cold, we use Lung7, Li4, Si3, UB62, Do14, GB20, Bladder10, and Bladder12. If there is cold B, Li4, REN6, and Do14, as well as local and distal acupuncture points along the appropriate channel. If there is cold in the stomach, we use stomach 21, stomach 34, spleen 4, REN6, REN13, bladder 21, and pericardium 6. If there is cold in the intestines, we use stomach 25, stomach 36, stomach 37, REN6, REN8, spleen 4, spleen 9, and bladder 25. And if there is cold in the uterus, REN4, REN6, DO4, bladder 23, kidney 3, kidney 7, kidney 13, and stomach 29. We use a draining or sedating needle technique, and MOXA is recommended. Lung 7, LI4, SI3, bladder 62, DO14, GB20, bladder 10, and bladder 12 all expel wind and cold, as well as activating Wei Qi. Kidney 3, kidney 7, DO4, REN4, REN6, and REN8 warm and activate Yang Qi. Stomach 21, stomach 25, stomach 34, stomach 37, bladder 21 and bladder 25 expel cold and regulate qi in the stomach and intestines. Spleen 4 regulates qi in the stomach and intestines. Pericardium 6 regulates qi in the middle jaw. Spleen 9 drains damp cold. Kidney 13 and stomach 29 expel cold from the uterus. 
When there is cold, it is best to avoid consuming food and beverages that are physically cold or have a cooling energy. It is beneficial to drink ginger tea or ingest other spices that have a warming and diaphoretic energy. It is important that the body is kept warm and dry. Invasions of cold can be caused by weight chi deficiency and yang chi, yang deficiency. And invasions of cold can result in yang deficiency. Thank you very much for listening. Let's discuss diagnosis according to six stages. Overview part two. In the three young stages, it is the young organs and channels that are affected. The symptoms and signs generally reflect that is an excess condition. The three young stages are more deficient in nature because in the preliminary stages, Seng Chi is relatively strong and this will result in more powerful symptoms due to the struggle between a strong Seng Chi and the pathogenic Chi. When pathogenic chi penetrates to the yin stages, Sen Chi will have become weakened and is no longer able to withstand the pathogenic chi. It is important to keep in mind that even though the interior deficient patterns in the six stages are ostensibly the same as some patterns of diagnosis, such as spleen yang deficient, for example, the disorder in the six stages has primarily arisen due to an invasion of exogenous pathogenic chi and not necessarily due to a diet and lifestyle. They may well be involved, but they are not the primary reason for the imbalance. Next, the Italian stage. This is the most superficial aspect of the six stages and the invasion at this stage is relatively superficial. There are four main patterns that can be differentiated at this stage. Two of them are channel level imbalances and are therefore pure exterior imbalances, but there are also two full organ imbalances where the exogenous pathogenic chi has penetrated into the interior. In one of these imbalances, there will still be a clear sign that the pathogenic chi is present in the exterior aspect. The two channel level imbalances are the Taiyang patterns, most often seen in the clinic and in everyday life. Sang Song Jin distinguished between an invasion of wind cold in the Taiyang aspect, where cold is the dominant pathogenic chi, and an invasion of wind cold where, where wind is dominant. The difference between the two situations is essentially that in the first scenario, it is a pure excess condition, whereas when wind is dominant, there is a, def a deficient and excess condition. The key symptoms that characterize the Taiyang stage are a superficial pulse, headache and stiffness in the neck and shoulder, and aversion to wind and cold. The Taiyang channel helps to govern and control Wei Qi, Wei Qi as well as the protecting the body against exogenous pathogenic Qi warms the skin and controls the sweat force. This has a significant implication for how many of the symptoms manifest themselves. In the time stage, exogenous pathogenic chi has invaded the body by penetrating the weight chi. It is usually wind and cold that have invaded the body. Cold by itself can have difficulty penetrating through the weight chi. This is because the cold has a yield contracting dynamic, and this will cause the pores in the skin to close. Wind, though, has a young and very scattering dynamic. Wind can therefore scatter weight chi and open the pores. Wind is therefore termed the spearhead that leads other forms of pathogenic chi into the body. Exogenous pathogenic chi can succeed in overcoming and breaking through the body's weight chi in three ways. If Wei Qi is very powerful, it will not require long-term exposure to the pathogenic Qi before it can invade the body. This could, for example, be when a person has fallen through the ice and has been strongly chilled by the cold water. Although it is only a short-term exposure to the cold, the cold is so powerful that it will able to pierce through the Wei Qi even 
in a person whose Reiki is strong and powerful. Exogenous pathogenic Qi can also penetrate the Wei Qi if there is a prolonged exposure to the pathogenic Qi. In this case, Wei Qi does not need to be as intense as in the first case. But because there is a continued and persistent influence, the pathogenic Qi will ob over time break through. An example of this could be a person who has a cycle home in, in the rain and sleep and been thoroughly drenched and cooled down. If they cycle two kilometers and when changed into dry clothes afterwards, they would not become ill. If, on the other hand, they cycle 15 kilometers and will not have the opportunity to change into dry clothes afterwards, they may well catch a cold. The final scenario where pathogenic chicken invade the tying stage is when Wei Qi is deficient. This will typically be a person whose Wei whose Qi is deficient. This could be an elderly person, a very small child, a person who's, who has just been ill, or a person who is physically run down. In this situation, the pathogenic Qi does not need to be very strong for it to be able to overcome the Wei Qi. The Wei Qi is simply too weak to protect the body. If a person with a strong Wei Qi goes for a walk for 15 minutes without a jacket on in the winter, their Wei Qi is strong enough to withstand the cold. But if a person who is very Qi deficient did the same, they may well catch a cold or fall ill. This is why elderly people have to wear more clothes than young people and are generally more sensitive to droughts and open windows. Even if a person has a strong Wei Qi, pathogenic Qi can easily invade the body if the person sweats while they are exposed to wind and cold. This is because the pores will be open, which allows exogenous pathogenic Qi to enter. This is why it is very important that people cover themselves with warm clothes after they have, for example, been running or done other forms of physical activity that have caused them to sweat. It is also the reason people catch colds when there is air conditioning. Thank you for your attention. We continue with treatment principles with another case history. Wait lang doc. Okay, ano na na pa ulit? Our patient is a woman, age 35. Uh, with the following clinical manifestations. So prior to the initial consultation, this patient had had a very heavy cold with a congested chest, an occipital headache, and alternating feelings of heat and cold. When she came for the consultation, she complained of a feeling of exhaustion, alternating feelings of heat and cold, slight depression, a slight hypochondrial pain, and loose stools. Her pulse is wiry and the tongue has a normal body color with thin white coating in the lung area. The diagnosis, this was originally an attack of exterior wind cold at the lesser yang stage. Now it is still at the lesser yang stage, but combined with greater yin stage. So to explain the diagnosis, the symptoms of the lesser yang pattern are alternating feeling of heat and cold, hypochondrial pain, slight depression, and a wiry pulse. The symptoms of the greater yin pattern are exhaustion and loose stools. Although this patient was seen three weeks after the onset, the pattern was still partially at the lesser yang stage and the pulse was all important in the diagnosis. Since this was wiry and full, it indicated that the pattern was still primarily of an excess character, even though the patient felt very tired, which is a deficiency symptom. So for the treatment principle, 
since the pattern is still primarily of an excess nature and is characterized by the presence of a pathogenic factor, which is when cold turned into heat at the lesser yang stage, the correct approach is to concentrate on expelling the pathogenic factor, even though the patient feels tired. When the pathogenic factor has been expelled, one can tonify the upright chi, in this case, the spleen chi. This was the plan of treatment adopted, and in the first treatment, triple burner 5, triple burner 6, and do 14 were needled with reducing method to clear heat and regulate the lesser yang. Reducing these points produce a nearly immediate and dramatic improvement, including the return of her energy. After reducing similar points again in the second treatment and the disappearance of the lesser yang symptoms, which is hypochondrial pain and wiry pulse. Attention was diverted to tonifying the body's chi, reinforcing lung nine, spleen six, stomach 36, and pericardium six. This is an example of the principle of expelling a pathogenic factor first and tonifying the upright chi later. From the point of view of root and manifestation, the root is represented by the heat, which is half in the interior and half in the exterior, which is the lesser yang stage, producing the various clinical manifestations. In this case, only the root was treated, clearing all the clinical manifestations. Thank you. We Continue with diagnosis according to Zanfu organ patterns. This time we talk about damp heat in the large intestine. This pattern will frequently be combined with other patterns, usually spleen and stomach imbalances. What makes this pattern difficult to treat is that there is yin and yang pathogenic factor which are bound together. Exactly how the symptom picture manifests will depend on which of these two elements is dominant. Damp heat in the large intestine will be defined in an eight principle diagnosis as an interior excess heat condition. The pattern can arise when there has been an invasion of exogenous damp heat, for example, after ingestion of spoiled food. In this case, it will be a purely excess condition. Usually, however, the pattern arises in the background of spleen chi deficiency or spleen yang deficiency conditions. This makes the situation more complicated because there will be a condition of interior excess heat that has arisen from a concurrent interior deficiency condition, which will in fact be an interior deficient cold condition if there is spleen yang deficiency. This requires a treatment strategy that will require both tonification and draining at different stages, as well as the clearing of heat and the warming of yang. Diet plays a significant role in this pattern. The diet itself can directly create damp heat when foods that create dampness and heat are excessively consumed. The diet can, though, also create imbalances in the middle jaw that subsequently result in the generation of dampness. The damp stagnation will then begin to ferment or combine with an existing heat condition. This is typical when liver chi stagnation heat is also present. The pattern can also occur after consumption of foods that are spoiled or infected, for example, with salmonella. Summer heat can directly invade the large intestine and create damp heat. Worry and speculation can bind and weaken spleen chi, leading to dampness, which can then transform into damp heat. Anger and frustration can create heat or stagnate liver chi, which then invades spleen. Symptoms and signs. There will be diarrhea, frequent defecations, stools are sticky, malodorous, and possibly contain blood or mucus. Defecation may be explosive, stinging or burning sensation in the rectum, abdominal pain that is not alleviated by the passing of stools. There will be abdominal bloating, the abdomen feels tight or distended when palpated, dark and scanty urine, thirst with no desire to drink, fever, feeling feverish or an aversion to heat, heaviness in the body, tongue is red with a yellow sticky coating on the root, possibly with elevated red papillae on the root, rapid and slippery pulse, possibly full in both sure positions. 
Key symptoms are diarrhea with strong smelling, sticky stools with yellowish sticky tongue coating. Treatment principle, drain damp heat from large intestine. Points, LI11, stomach 25, stomach 27, stomach 37, stomach 44, spleen 6, spleen 9, bladder 22, and bladder 25. If there is blood in the stool, add spleen 1 and spleen 10. Needle technique, draining, moxa on spleen 1. LI11, stomach 25, stomach 27, stomach 37, stomach 44, and bladder 25, drain damp heat from the large intestine. Spleen 6, spleen 9, bladder 22, drain dampness. Spleen 1 and spleen 10, stop bleeding. If there is damp heat in the large intestine, the patient should avoid consuming food and beverages that create dampness, heat or damp heat. Deep fried foods, alcohol, hot spices, dairy products, and sugar should be avoided completely. Damp heat in the large intestine can be caused by spleen chi deficiency, spleen yang deficiency, food stagnation, invasions of pathogenic chi. Damp heat in the large intestine can result in spleen chi deficiency, chi stagnation in the intestines, and blood stagnation. Thank you. Okay, but before we end, let's summarize damp heat in the large intestine. So etiology is excessive consumption of hot and greasy foods leading to stomach heat, damp heat in the stomach and spleen, emotional problems like prolonged anxiety and worry leading to spleen chi deficiency. Possible presenting condition would be dysentery, colitis, Crohn's disease. There will be diarrhea with abdominal pain, incomplete defecation, mucus and blood in the stools, stools with an offensive odor, burning sensation in the rectum, tenesmus, scanty dark urine, sweating, thirst but no desire to drink, heaviness in the limbs, bitter taste. Pulse would be slippery and rapid, tongue red with a sticky yellow coat. Treatment principle, that clear heat, disinhibit dampness, resolve toxin. For acupuncture treatment, we have spleen 9 to resolve damp in the lower burner, as well as bladder 22, stomach 27 to promote urination, bladder 25 to clear heat from the intestine, REN 12 to resolve dampness, stomach 44 to harmonize the intestines, spleen 6 to resolve damp in the lower burner, stomach 25 stop diarrhea, REN 6 to regulate chi in the lower burner, LI 11 to clear heat, and stomach 37 to clear and disinhibit damp heat. Needling is using the drainage method, we can add moxa. Thank you for your attention. Let's discuss diagnosis according to eight principles. G deficiency. In a deficient condition, there is a deficiency of one or more of the vital substances. This will manifest with reduced activity of the body's physiological processes. How the symptoms manifest will depend on which substance has been weakened. The condition will typically be chronic. Qi deficiency, a generalized Qi deficiency condition can arise when there is a weakness in one or more of the Qi producing organs. There may also be a Qi deficient condition in a single organ, which is the consequence of an enfeeblement of an organ concern. In addition to fatigue, the typical symptoms of a generalized Qi deficient condition will be a weakened or low voice and disinclination to speak due to a lack of song Qi. Some people with Qi deficient C may de tend to have a poor posture and have difficulty keeping their back straight because there is not enough Qi to keep the body back. The face will be pain as well the tongue. The pulse will be weak, reflecting the lack of chi. The fatigue will increase as the day goes on and will be worse in the afternoon and evening. It will be worse after physical and mental activity. If there is pain or discomfort, it will be relieved by pressure. Other symptoms will depend on which organ is weakened. Because the lungs, spleen, and kidneys are often involved, there will usually be symptoms and signs such as loose stools, poor appetite, shortness of breath, spontaneous sweating, and frequent urination. As described above, other organs can be chi deficient, not just the chi producing organs. 
there will be signs of decreased activity in the organs functioning. For example, high chi deficiency can manifest with symptoms and signs such as palpitation, spontaneous sweating, and shyness. Again, the symptoms and signs of an imbalance in an organ will most pronounce when the person is tired and after insertion or activity. For the etiology, chi deficiency arises either because of one of the chi producing organs are weakened or because the body is burdened by overexertion, lack of breast, or disease. For the symptoms and signs, there is fatigue, pale face, loose tools, weak voice, reluctant to speak, spontaneous sweating. Frequent urination, slump posture, weak and slow movement, weak pulse, pale tongue. The key symptoms, there is fatigue, pale face, and a weak pulse. Treatment principle is to tonify chi. Acupuncture points, choose from brain 12, brain 6, lung 9, stomach 36, spleen 3, spleen 6, kidney 3, kidney 7, UB13, UB20, UB21, and UB23. Needle technique is to tonifying, moxa is recommended. Explanation, brain 12, stomach 36, spleen 3, spleen 6, UB20 and UB21, tonify spleen chi. Lung 9 and UB13, tonify lung chi. <clears throat> kidney 3, kidney 7 and UB23, tonify kidney chi. Brain 6, tonifies U and chi. Relevant advice, if a person is chi deficient, they will benefit from eating a diet that tonifies chi. They should eat as much prepared and hot food as possible. They should avoid raw vegetables, salads, cold drinks, and ice cream. They should also avoid food that is unrefined, coarse, and difficult to digest. This means that it is better for them to eat white rice instead of brown rice and to avoid too many full meal products. Even though these products are richer in minerals, fiber, vitamins, and so on, they are more difficult to digest. They must also avoid foods that create dampness, such as sweet, dairy products, bananas, dried fruit, honey, artificial sweeteners, stevia, etc. because they will further weaken the spleen. It will be beneficial for a person to base their diet on soup, stew, steam, boiled or suited vegetables, or treats on the morning. That is food that is easily digestible. They should also chew their food well so that it is easier to transform. Person with lung chi deficiency will benefit from being out in nature or anywhere else where there is fresh air. Yoga and chi qigong often utilize breathing exercises. This will have a benef beneficial effect on lung chi. It is important that the person with lung chi is conscious of their posture because sitting hunched forward or stoop will constrain lung chi. A person with chi deficiency must be careful that they do not overexert themselves and that they get adequate rest. If a man is kidney chi deficient, he should avoid too much sex and ejaculating. A woman who is chi deficient should try to avoid becoming pregnant. Both genders should avoid lifting heavy objects as this strains the kidney chi. Kidneys contain our energetic, energetic reserves. It is therefore vital that a person who is kidney chi deficient does not overexert themselves either to work or through sports. They should eat a diet that strengthens the kidney. Thank you for your attention. Let's continue our discussion on depression with the pattern weary injuring the mind. Weary injuring the mind has the following clinical manifestations. Depression, mental confusion, feeling absent, anxiety, no desire to do anything, insomnia, sadness, worry, crying, stretching, and yawning. The tongue is pale, sticky, with sticky white coating, and the pulse is fine and very slightly wiry.
uh, on its pathology and mental emotional pattern. The pattern of worry injuring the mind is an is an empty pattern giving rise to depression. Mm -hmm. It is caused primarily by worry, which not chi, but also in the long run leads to depletion of chi and blood. Heart blood is the residence of the mind. And when it is deficient, the mind is deprived of its residence, resulting in depression, anxiety, and insomnia. The patient presents with characteristic manifestations of deficiency, that is pallor, slow walking, slow speech, sad expression, and weak pulse. The deficiency makes the patient lacking in drive so that he or she feels unwilling or incapable of doing things. The pattern of very injuring the mind is more common in young women. For the treatment principle, we nourish the heart and calm the mind. In acupuncture, we can use the following points. Lung 9, Lung 3, Bladder 13, Do 12, Ren 6, Heart 5, Stomach 36, Bladder 20, Bladder 49, Bladder 47, and Do 20. If the patient is crying, we can add Do 20 and Do 26. If there is mental dullness due to worry, thinking, shock, and fear, we can use Ren 12 and 50 Moxa cones. All points. We needle with reinforcing method. So to explain the choice of points, lung nine, lung three, bladder 13, and do 12, tonify lung chi and lift move. Lung three is a window of heaven point. Brand six tonifies chi in general. Heart five tonifies heart chi. Stomach 36 and bladder 20 tonify the spleen chi. Bladder 49 tonifies the intellect or E that resides in the spleen. It is used to brighten the mind. Bladder 47 stimulates the coming and going of the ethereal soul. Do 20 lifts the mood. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>